In 2006, a team from Boeing proposed an incredible new use for America's most legendary air superiority fighter that called for mounting a 45-foot rocket to its back. This rocket-carrying F-15 would have been given the logical but dramatic moniker of F-15 Global Strike Eagle, and it could have revolutionized how America deployed hypersonic weapons or put small payloads into orbit. Let's dive into the Global Strike Eagle concept. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. The idea behind Boeing's Global Strike Eagle was to use the Eagle's powerful afterburning turbofan engines and the incredible amount of lift offered by its design to ferry rockets up to high speeds and altitudes before releasing them to ignite and fly the remainder of the journey into orbit. Launching orbital payloads from an aircraft would eliminate the need for expensive rocket launch facilities while making it possible for F-15s to rapidly deploy small payloads into orbit from anywhere on the planet that has an airstrip and a hangar. It was a relatively low-cost solution to a very expensive problem that America's military, particularly the Space Force, continues to tangle with to this day. But despite a very realistic approach to the Global Strike Eagle design, Boeing's pitch likely seemed a bit too crazy to put into practice, at least as far as we know. The idea and its accompanying designs may look more like something Wiley e. Coyote might build than anything to come out of Boeing's brain trust. But the official proposal offers a number of pretty startling conclusions about the feasibility of this sort of an effort. In fact, although Boeing's Global Strike Eagle never made it past the proposal stage, their early data seem to suggest that a rocket-packing eagle could actually work. If you find yourself wondering why the F-15, the answer is pretty simple. It's just an absolutely incredible aircraft. The F-15 airframe has proven so versatile over the years that it's been the basis for tons of programs and proposals, from the idea to stick it on aircraft carriers to literally shooting down a satellite. But as incredible or even downright crazy as some of these efforts may have been, they literally all pale in comparison to Boeing's 2006 proposal to strap a 45-foot-long three-stage rocket motor to the Eagle's back. If you're still fuzzy on why you'd strap a rocket to a fighter, the most obvious reason would be for the rapid deployment of orbital and suborbital munitions like modern hypersonic boost glide vehicles. And indeed, mention of using the system to deploy America's Mach 5 common aero vehicle did make its way into the proposal. But the bigger benefit, Boeing seemed to suggest, would be as a readily available and low-cost launch platform that could put small payloads into low Earth orbit from practically anywhere on the globe. You see, despite a greater availability of space launch platforms than ever before, America's orbital efforts have long faced challenges related to launch infrastructure and the incredibly high costs of single-use rockets. But despite the waiting lists for launch complexes and the immense expense, America and the rest of the world really continues to find itself more reliant than ever on space-based assets for everything from the operation of advanced combat systems to listening to dummies like me talk about defense stuff on YouTube. For the most part, these jobs are filled by large, complex, and expensive satellites in high geosynchronous orbits that take years to get from the designer's pad to the launch pad. As a result, cutting-edge defense and intelligence satellites are usually already outdated by the time they reach orbit. But dated eyes in the sky aren't really the problem here. The issue is the lengthy timelines. Because if a conflict were to break out between the U.S. and a near-peer opponent like Russia or China, America's fragile satellite infrastructure would probably be the first target. Russia and China have both already demonstrated the ability to engage satellites with kinetic weapons or missiles, and in recent years both have also deployed inspector satellites that can grab, interfere with, or destroy other satellites in orbit. Russia's secretly deployed and tested weapons in space before, including a cannon, and it stands to reason that these nations may have orbital assets that the general public just isn't aware of. The problem is most of these satellites went up before other nations had anti-satellite capabilities, and I'll stop belaboring laboring this satellite vulnerability point with a quote from former Secretary of the Air Force Heather Wilson that really sums it up quite nicely. We built exquisite glass houses in a world without stones. There isn't a solution to this problem, there's a bunch of solutions, but one of the things the Space Force is placing a new focus on is quickly fielding a much larger number of smaller, cheaper satellites that would fly in low Earth orbit to supplement the bigger, more expensive platforms. 
These satellites could fill gaps created by damaged bigger satellites, or provide rapid communications or intelligence information in areas that would otherwise be really tough to do so. They could even help to locate the sources of radio frequency jamming that's interfering with access to those higher flying and more capable assets. But, and there's always a but, in order to leverage this approach amid a large-scale conflict with a technologically capable opponent, America needs a way to get a bunch of small satellites into low Earth orbit really quickly and from locations all around the world. Which brings us to 2006, where I like to imagine a group of guys and gals at Boeing were talking about this problem and hanging out near an F-15 when the new guy pointed at the jet and was like, couldn't we just launch rockets off of one of these things? And everybody laughed at first, but then realized maybe he was right. Now that, I want to be clear, is completely conjecture, but what isn't is that on April 24th, 2006, a Boeing team led by Timothy T. Chen, Preston W. Ferguson, David A. Deemer, and John Hensley attended the fourth Responsive Space Conference in Los Angeles with their unique proposal in hand. Now, this proposal came in the form of a 17-slide PowerPoint and an accompanying 10-page write-up, and it built upon a previous study conducted by a team of seven Boeing staffers, led by payloads and structures engineer at the time, Tom Mead. All of us around here, and probably everybody watching, is aware that there have been plenty of crazy proposals to come out of aviation firms over the years, from massive nuclear-powered flying aircraft carriers to actual flying saucers. But despite targeting space itself, this proposal was really pretty grounded. The idea behind the Global Strike Eagle wasn't to sell the U.S. government on a pricey new aircraft for space launch operations, but rather to take the equipment Uncle Sam already had laying around and assemble it in a way that would offer a groundbreaking new capability for a pretty low cost. I'll quote the proposal itself. The utilization of the F-15 as the initial stage of the launch system provides not only the expected performance benefits, reduced velocity requirements for the rocket stages, lower aerodynamic drag, and decreased atmospheric pressure, but also the operational advantages inherent to using an existing support infrastructure. In keeping with that low-budget mindset, the proposal calls for using an existing F-15C or D Eagle with high hours as the initial technology demonstrator. It would serve as an airborne launch platform for a small rocket, likely from under wing or a center pylon, with plans to move on to using a more highly modified F-15E Strike Eagle as the basis for what would become the first true global Strike Eagle. Of course, the first significant hurdle this concept has to overcome was already pretty apparent at this stage. Despite the power and payload capabilities offered by the F-15 airframe, it would be utterly impossible to mount a rocket of this size or weight beneath the aircraft. Previous studies of F-15E payload capabilities suggested that underwing pylons couldn't manage anything much heavier than around 220 pounds. Of course, this same year, NASA would successfully mount a 1,000-pound 13-foot AIM-54 Phoenix missile on a custom centerline hardpoint devised for their F-15B, but their limited success in the effort only further confirmed that sticking a 45-foot 30,000-pound rocket on the bottom of this aircraft would prevent it from rolling down the runway at all, let alone pitching up for takeoff. So the decision was made to mount what they called the rocket launch vehicle on the top of the F-15 instead, taking advantage of the wide tailspan between upright stabilizers to allow for a larger diameter rocket. This new top centerline pylon concept was actually substantiated by testing originally intended for adding ordnance, and according to Boeing, four internal bulkheads within the fuselage would provide adequate strength to support this massive rocket. But even with the rocket now riding atop the fighter, its massive size still created problems for the Global Strike Eagle concept. The rocket's nose cone would not only cause clearance issues with the cockpit canopy, it would make it impossible to eject. So not only would you have to find a pilot crazy enough to fly an F-15 with a rocket on its back, you'd have to find someone crazy enough to not want to eject if something went wrong. And that seemed like reason enough to just eliminate the pilot from the equation altogether and convert the Global Strike Eagle to use a communication link-based flight control system. Now, that might sound futuristic, but that was entirely feasible already. Boeing had already put similar systems in their X-45 and X-36 technology demonstrators. And this change would also offer the added benefit of not having to recruit a pilot with both an affinity for rockets and a death wish. 
Because there'd be no pilot on board, this conversion from Strike Eagle to Global Strike Eagle would require very little in the way of avionics or systems changes. In fact, many systems, like onboard radar, could just be removed entirely because of the aircraft's non-combat role. And theoretically speaking, a Global Strike Eagle and its support team could be flown to pretty much any airstrip with a few thousand feet of good runway, prep their aircraft for launch, and deploy a payload into orbit in fairly short order. When conducting these operations from military airstrips with existing F-15 infrastructure, these launch operations could be pretty easily hidden. I mean, most of the infrastructure outside the hangar would look like it was for any other F-15. Now, like the fighter launch platform, the rocket carried by Boeing's Global Strike Eagle would also be a bargain. Boeing intended to use off-the-shelf solid rocket motors in conjunction with motors already produced for America's arsenal of ICBMs. By using rockets America already had a supply of, they wouldn't just save money, they'd also save a ton of time in development. The first stage of the Global Strike Eagle's launch vehicle rocket would carry an SR-19 solid rocket engine sourced from the second stage of a Minuteman II ICBM, and it would produce around 60,300 pounds of thrust for a bit more than 287 seconds. The second stage would carry an Orion 50XL, sourced from the third stage of that same ICBM, and it would provide another 34,500 pounds of thrust for the next 289 seconds. Finally, the third stage would pack an Orion 38 rocket motor that's used in a variety of small rocket applications, and it would provide another 10,600 pounds of thrust for another 289 or so seconds, and that would finally put the payload into low Earth orbit. And believe it or not, according to a Boeing study, the F-15's aerodynamic design would not only sustain adding this rocket to its back, to some degree it seemed even well suited for it. I'll quote the proposal again. Preliminary computational fluid dynamics modeling was conducted in the F-15 Global Strike Eagle and Lift Vehicle configuration to ensure no aerodynamic showstoppers. The analysis indicates only minor reduction in F-15 lift due to the payload and lift vehicle and increased vertical tail loading, which is compensated by a change of aircraft's angle of attack by one degree. And it gets crazier from there. In order to eventually ferry rockets as big as 30,000 pounds into the sky, with payloads on board as big as 1,200 pounds, Boeing suggested incorporating JADO, or Jet Assisted Takeoff Rocket Boosters, on the F-15 itself. They also suggested leveraging Mass Injection Pre-Compression Cooling, or MIPCC, for a bit more power throughout the flight envelope. Without going too deep down the MIPCC rabbit hole, it's effectively a water or coolant injection ahead of the engine's compressor that evaporates and cools as it passes through. That cooling effect allows the engine to operate at higher velocities and altitudes than the heat produced by these engines would normally allow. Now, it's not quite like Dom hitting the NOS in his fart-canned Supra, but it is a cheap and effective way to pull a bit more power out of an existing jet engine. The launch process would begin by pitching the F-15 upward at a 40.4 degree angle and increasing speed to Mach 1.7 at an altitude of 27,700 feet, at 47,800 feet and at a speed of around Mach 1.35. The rocket launch vehicle would detach from the F-15 and give the fighter enough time, about four seconds, to pitch down and away from that first stage rocket motor before it ignited. Once separated, the rocket would do what rockets do. It would burn through each successive stage until payload separation occurred in low Earth orbit, which would be around 400 seconds, or an ominous 6.66 minutes, after the F-15 began its launch maneuver. That means a fully prepped F-15 Global Strike Eagle could put a payload into low Earth orbit in less than 20 minutes, maybe even more like 10 or 15. But again, that speed isn't particularly groundbreaking, it's the fact that you could do this from practically anywhere in the world, that is. If we take Boeing's claims at face value, this concept could indeed offer the U.S. Air Force with a comparably inexpensive option for launching the very sort of micro and nano satellites the Space Force is now placing a ton of emphasis on rapidly fielding. In other words, in a strange way, this proposal might be more promising today than it was in 2006. But the U.S. has a number of rocket launch options available to it, and no pressing need to invent novel ones that include strapping big rockets to perfectly good fighter jets. At least, not yet. And while yes, this system could be used to deploy hypersonic weapons, relying on a very small number of heavily modified rocket-toting F-15s to deploy these weapons just wouldn't be very tactically handy. 
It really all boils back down to that same tactical versus strategic value conversation. Because while you can get some tactical value out of the Global Strike Eagle, it's just way more strategically valuable to develop weapons that can be deployed from a broad variety of platforms that are either lightly modified or even better, don't have to be modified at all. But to be clear, that doesn't mean this concept doesn't have some intriguing benefits, especially for the rapid launch of small satellite payloads into low Earth orbit. We may never see the Global Strike Eagle manifest as it appears on the pages of these Boeing documents, but there are a number of publicly disclosed efforts to get payloads into space from aircraft. It seems all but certain that there are a number of others tucked behind a curtain of classified funding. So while the Global Strike Eagle may indeed seem crazy, the impetus behind it and the approach that it takes to deploying payloads aren't really that crazy at all. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, don't forget to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.